Welcome to today's webinar which is on the topic of identifying and linking physical samples with data using IGSN, the International Geosample Number. So let's get started. Uh, my name is Natasha Simons and I work with the Australian National Data Service and I'm going to be your host for the webinar today. Uh, my colleague Susanna Sabine is in Canberra behind the scenes and co-hosting the webinar with me. So this webinar will look at how you can reference physical samples online using a world standard, globally unique, persistent identifier scheme, the International Geosample Number, as well as discuss the International Linking Environmental Data and Samples Symposium, which was held last week at the CSIRO Black Mountain Laboratories in Canberra. This webinar is the second in a series examining persistent identifiers and their use in research. The first women webinar we looked at citing um, grey literature using DOIs and the recording of this is available on the ANS YouTube channel. The third in the series will look at how to link publications and data uh, through the International Scholix Initiative. So I would also like to acknowledge the Commonwealth Government for their support of ANS under the ANCRIS program. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today, Dr. Leslie Wyborn, who's an adjunct fellow with the National Computational Infrastructure Facility and Research School of Earth Sciences at the Australian National University in Canberra, and Dr. Jens Klump, who's OCE Science Leader, Earth Science Informatics for the CSIRO Mineral Resources and based in Perth. I'll now hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Leslie Wyborn. All right, so what I'm starting out with is I'm going to do the first part which is about identifying samples. It's something that's dear to my heart because some of you know I used to be a field geologist and I have collected thousands of samples in my career. So how we're going to um, organise this is introduce the IGSN identifier for samples, outlining the application availability for researchers and then Jens will hand over to the global picture and give an update on the symposium that was held last week. So what we want to do is, you know, what is it and what, how do you use it? How do you get an IGSN? And the science use case is fairly typical. Um, samples are the first class output of scientific research in my opinion. A lot of our data ties back to samples and hence so do our publications. So why do we need unique identifiers for samples part one? And you can see on this map from Kirsten Nannett is that in the EarthChem database run by the NSF, you can see all the samples that are labelled M1 from everywhere. And M probably stands for me, number one. And so what we find is we start to do aggregations of samples. This is a very common problem. A second problem that emerges is, again, um, I do a lot of used to do a lot of analytical work. And it was quite common to go and get a sample and from that sample you did sample splits. And quite often the sample splits were given different numbers or it was put on a different machine, it was given a different number. Or the sample was given to somebody else and they went and relabeled it according to the in-house rules and repositories. And so here is all the different names for a highly valuable sample from a cruise in the Pacific. And so as we are moving now towards um, data aggregations, we really need to be able to uniquely identify samples and analytical data and publications derived from these samples. And this was the driver behind um, Kirsten Lennett in the US and a few others um, getting involved in trying to set up a unique identifier system for samples. So. What the IGSN does is it provides persistent identifiers that are guaranteed to be unique by a hierarchical system. It facilitates internet-based discovery and access to physical samples, um, provides web applications and programmatic access to sample metadata catalogues, and it helps networks with sample repositories and data centres. It ensures preservation of and access to sample data it aids, aids in the identification of samples in the literature and there is one that you can actually click on um, if you've got the time. So what can it be used for? 
IGSN stands for International Geoscience for Sample Number, but increasingly we are finding it being used for water, biological materials and all sorts of things. We use for collections, grouping of samples, or for a sample feature such as a borehole or an outcrop. And samples can be linked to each other through the other related identifier metadata element. So that green thing down the bottom is actually a rock or a mineral called olivine and above it you can see that we often take mineral separates out of those rocks or we can create solutions. And so you bring back one thing from the field which probably cost you a fortune to collect and through IGSN we can link the parent to all derived samples that come from it. It enables you to track the sample life cycle. So in CSIRO it's used for tracking samples and to support sample logistics. So starting out in the field, and we call it IGSN is really the birth certificate. You have unambiguous identification and metadata capture with the mobile app and it's being given the IGSN in the field. Then as we um, take that sample into the lab, we can identify all the derivative processes and analytical techniques we apply to that sample and tie the data to it and then finally the sample goes into the repository and we can trace it through um, collections and samples in storage catalogs and maintain sample logistics say when a sample is lent out to another um, museum or another institute. It's um, like I say, it's like when you're born you get a birth certificate now what we're enabling is samples as they are collected to be given a birth certificate that goes through them with them through life. As Jens will explain, it's based on the DOI data site. And so what we can do now is we've got the specimen IGSN, we then link it to the spectral results, and finally we link it through to the publication. And this IGSN number has attracted a fair bit of attention and it is endorsed by the Coalition for Publishing Data in the Earth and Space Sciences and in Elsevier and Copernicus Earth Science Journals. You are encouraged to um, put the IGSN number on samples that you cite in the literature. And so um, again, in the digital age, you can get interested in a particular specimen and trace through its history and anything else that has been done on that specimen. So as a system review, what you do is you register a sample with what we call an allocating agent. The allocating agent then registers the sample with IGSN EV, which is the international implementation agent, as you can see here. There are three current allocation agents in Australia, CSIRO, Geoscience Australia and Curtin University. So what I'll do next is um, take you through how these agencies are using it in different ways. So CSIRO became a member of um, IGSN in 2013 and I currently use it for the repository of their cross research group over in Perth and it takes mineral rocks, synthetic materials um, in the Capricorn Distal Project, they're using it for water, vegetation, soil, rock and regolith. And CSIRO is looking now to use it for their soils collection in Canberra and their insect collection. So that's why we kind of refer to it as the IGSN now and not the International Geo Sample Number because it certainly is getting being used more. If we go to Geoscience Australia, they've got the second largest collection in the world, registered samples, 1.6 million samples covering mineral, mineral, mineral separates, rocks, um, thin sections, that's microslope slides of rocks and fossils. Geoscience Australia also is about to be, if they're not already, the registration agent for the geological surveys and the states and territories. Uh, Curtin University has a different um, use case and there they're using it more, as we mentioned earlier, tracking sample sample splits through the laboratory. And I'd like to acknowledge ANS because they sponsored the development of this project in collaboration with the Curtin University Library. And the CSIRO, you, uh, Geological Survey Western Australia, 
are actually working together with this. So as I said, we've got the three agents. Um, Curtin is only operating for Curtin University. Um, and we're hoping to expand that so it can become more available to the rest of the research community. And so again, we were able to get some more funding from INCRIS through the Research Data Services Project. And they made it possible to develop a demonstrator for a common geosample portal, which you can actually see here. And so metadata from the three um, agents is harvested in your common metadata portal to discover um, samples created by any Australian IGSN member. And um, the Australians have agreed to a common metadata schema, even though you've got quite a diversity of samples. And so if you are hoping that as this grows, if you want to find any information about a physical sample, this will be the place you go. I will now hand over to Jens, who will take it into a global perspective and also discuss some of the technical issues and the results from the symposium that we held last week, which was about trying to actually extend this into the environmental areas, that is, from its original intent within the solid earth sciences. Thanks, Leslie. Yes. I like to start with saying, may all your problems be technical. It's usually technical problems can be overcome. Uh, um, it's also a whole social network behind technical solutions, and this is where the global perspective comes in. So the IGSN implementation organization is the body that we created to carry this on the global stage. It's an organization, it's a charitable organization incorporated under German law, um, registered in Potsdam in Germany. At present, it has 19 members on four continents. The governance model, uh, Leslie already mentioned, is a so-called hierarchical model, hierarchical delegation. You can think of it in the way that you assign IP numbers in the um, internet in the network. Um, and the IGSN identifiers themselves are registered through the IGSN agents. And to make sure that there's no overlap in numbers, each IGSN agent is given a so-called namespace for registrations of IGSN. And as an example, all IGSN registered by Geoscience Australia start with AU. And then after that, it's up to Geoscience Australia to make sure that these identifiers are unique. CSIRO starts um, identifiers with CS. So we delegated some of that to the Capricorn Digital Footprints project and gave them a namespace CSCAP. And then after that, that's their responsibility to make sure the names are unique and they don't interfere with any other uh, projects or infrastructures in CSRO that are using IGSNs. Technically, um, IGSN builds on an existing technical base and community, the um, data site model. So we basically clone data site to use the um, technical base, which is ultimately based on the handle system for persistent identifiers, but also a lot of the governance and how this is run is based on the example of data site. And we work with them very closely also to see that we align our technical architectures and to make the collaboration and interlinking as easy as possible. Um, there's two links here uh, to our technical um, documentation and to our code repositories on GitHub. So the status of IGSN on the global scale is it's still work in progress. But we have active registrations agents in Australia, CSRO, Kurt University, Geoscience Australia, but also GFZ Potsdam, the German Research Center for Geosciences, um, the Data Center for the um, Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University, the Data Center for Marine and Environmental Sciences at the University of Bremen, and then sometimes it's difficult for government institutions to join another foreign organization. So the German Geological Survey, BGR, and the US Geological Survey have some 
technical or legal issues to join this organization. So they register uh, IGSNs by proxy through other allocation agents. The interesting story we're hitting now is that we're not only identifying samples within one institution, but we are now moving samples between institutions. And this is where the real value of um, IGSN becomes visible. Leslie already mentioned the case of um, the John DeLater Center at Curtin University. And here they have adopted IGSN. So in this case, if the sample has an IGSN, it will be carried through the process and any data that can from the analytical processes are linked with this already existing identifier. If the sample is not yet identified by an IGSN, the John D. Later Center assigns it an IGSN. The other case is subsampling. Leslie mentioned that already, that sometimes you, have, you take subsamples. And here, that becomes a bit more complicated. Um, it depends on where this is done by whom and where the subsample then resides. So I won't go into the details now because that is something that needs to be discussed for the particular use case. The important point here is that any subsample should be identified with it by its own IGSN to make it uniquely identifiable as well and then link it to, the, to its parent sample. So what, what's happening next? Um, what we saw at the, at the symposium last week is that um, we have already made good progress building a developer community around IGSN, but that needs to carry on further. We um, document best practices to show how it can be used and also build reference implementations of services that um, others can test their services against. And the next steps, which we are already taking, is expanding to link to identifying and linking objects in other domains, not only in the geosciences. But ultimately, what we want to see is that other domains start reusing the IGSN technology. So maybe not IGSN in the strict sense through the existing organization, but as we copy data site. Um, other domains might copy IGSN as um, technology and governance model for persistent identifiers in their specific domain. So that's what I want to say about IGSN from my side. And I want to give you a brief report back on the symposium we had last week um, called Linking Environmental Data and Samples. This was a cutting edge science symposium um, which got its seed funding from the CSRO Research Plus office. And the goals were to bring international researchers, leaders to Australia, and also to provide a forum for early career researchers to engage with others and with the and international experts. So um, we have a web page, and it's probably easiest to note the short link, the Google um, short link. But we also, besides the seed funding from CSRO, um, received um, sponsorship from other organizations, the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, Geoscience Australia, the US National Science Foundation, the um, Earth Science Information Partnership in the US, NCI, Atlas of Living Australia, Oscope, and TURN, which those um, organizations mainly funded travel for international experts. What we discussed at this symposium was the science drivers. Why are we interested in linking um, anything with something through semantic web technologies? And that's because we have a rich resource of samples that support scientific investigation. And we wanted to discuss, and we did discuss, how we link these to the data sets that were derived from the samples. And then how can we link samples and data to the literature where, they, where the samples are interpreted and put into context? And last but not least, how can we include machines as users? Why do we want to do that? Because our body of data 
information knowledge is growing at a much faster pace than any of our minds can comprehend and uh, machines can be very helpful in trying to find things in, in these very, very rich holdings. To me, uh, it was also an important point not only to discuss the theory and, and the future perspective of linked data, but also to look at the solutions. Can we get it to work? And so we discussed what is the role of infrastructure for building the linked data federation and how can we support the evolution of linked data. What we saw is that heterogeneity is inherent and we have to have mediation mechanisms. We cannot build one thing for all. And this raises one question, is that is how precise do terms need to be because the commonly held wisdom is that computers don't understand ambiguity, so you have to be 100% precise, but that we cannot achieve. So we have to suffer some degree of imprecision, but vocabularies that are useful will be adopted. That is something that we can already see. But to distill what is the essence is that we have a fabric of science where we ask which elements produce output we have a process of science, how are these outputs produced, and we have a language of science, how do we describe these elements. And This is something that um, needs to be, um, where we have to find solutions at different levels um, in the linked data framework. As I mentioned at the start of my part of this presentation, there are social and community factors um, to get things like this working. And uh, Paul Box from CSIRO, Land and Water, said that the greatest organizational effectiveness is achieved when technology systems fit social systems. So it's not that you build it and they will come, but it has to support the this, uh, processes that already exist that will make it more likely to have success. Certainly, the uh, question is who bears the co cost and what would be the incentive to contribute. And we've been building things in this domain for a while, and so it was also very useful to discuss the fail patterns. And we identified two major fail patterns. The one is the anti life of Brian pattern that I am different, uh, so that's why I have to do things differently. That can lead to failure. And the other one is the too big to fail pattern, where something should have ended long ago, but we've invested too, ma too many resources, and so everybody is embarrassed to pull the plug. It would have been better to allow things um, to fail quickly and, and start with a fresh view. Thanks very much, Jens. Thanks, Jens and Leslie. Just while people are thinking about questions, perhaps you could give us an idea of how many IGSNs have been assigned and what types of samples those have been assigned to? So in the global total, we're approaching 6 million IGSNs. Most of those are geological materials, but um, we also have an increasing number of water, um, plant materials, soils, um, and also places. Like a borehole is not an object, it's, it's something else. But since the material that's coming from a borehole is very tightly coupled to that feature, we also identify that feature. Okay, um, researchers are generally a bit more familiar with DOIs. Uh, can you put forward a few arguments that you would put to research about why they would uh, select an IGSN over a DOI? The reason, there's one historical reason that when we decided to go for a global system a couple of years back, that was before Datasite existed, and TIB Hannover was running the show. They we, they pushed us back and said it is a really great idea, but it's out of scope. So we went our own way, and in that we discovered that there are specific governance issues in how we 
create these identifiers and a resolving mechanism and what metadata we use that are quite specific and not well covered by the more bibliographic world of, of DOI. But DOI data sites are changing. They're changing the business model. They're changing the way things are run. So we are in a, a conversation and let's see how things develop in future. The systems are technically compatible. So maybe we will merge one day. Okay, so watch this space. <laughs> Um, there's a question from Josh Brown. Other than the international legal issues, what barriers are there to IGSNs being adopted? Uh, the legal issues are a basic, actually a very specific problem to government institutions that cannot easily join foreign organizations. The main problem to adoption is that it needs to be introduced into workflows and um, so that changes how people work and that is, in my view, the main barrier to adoption that, um, yeah, people have to ch do changes to what they do and that usually they're not, they're busy enough so they don't want any extra work. So we have to make this simple or provide other good reasons to to make it worthwhile. Um, another issue too is that if you've got an organisation that's fairly well set up and has an internal system that guarantees unique identifiers, then if your organisation registers, it is a reasonably simple process. What we have noticed is organisations that are full of M1, M2, M3, you know, people using repeated numbers and they don't have an internally consistent unique identifier or number, don't, not, not identifier but number, then they do struggle a bit to um, introduce this much more complex. And that's why yeah, the, that's, village, the surveys were fairly good at this because they had unique systems. So that's a very good point because in the case of Geoscience Australia we just had to put AU in front of their numbers and it was done. Okay, we're coming up to time. There's one other question there. How does Curtin University Library support IGSN? Um, his name's Mat Matthias. Oh, I've forgotten it. Somebody can somebody Matthias. help me. Matthias. Matthias. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I would suggest you go and talk to him. But the Curtin Li University Library has been very supportive of this whole project. Um, yes, so Josh has, uh, sorry, John Brown has made a good point that Matthias is now at UWA. Um, oh. <laughs> so maybe uh, someone else at Curtin University that we could share, uh, perhaps okay. when I do the follow-up email, if there's some contact details perhaps for each of the uh, allocating agencies, that would be useful if I could share that in the email for people. Brett McInnes from Curtin University would be the best then because he kind of runs the project in collaboration uh, with Ains and the library, okay? Okay, and John Brown is at Curtin University. John Brown's on the call now, so I think he's saying that you could talk to him if you wanted yeah. some information. So I'll check in with you, John, after, after the webinar. And sorry, one other question. Are there competing IDs in this space or does this look like this will be the gold standard? Not in the geoscience space, but there certainly are others in the other areas. And one of the, um, while we're being sort of open about IGSN, is that it has been one of the more successful ones. And we often wonder why, and we think it's because of, one, it has a very good governance structure, and secondly, its compatibility with data site and DOIs. Um, Jens, would you like to add anything to that? Um, it was an interesting discussion during the symposium last week where we had quite a number of people from the biodiversity world who had tried to introduce a life science identifier over the past 10 years, but then that system was quietly buried recently um, because adoption was just too hard. It was technically immature and it did not have a, a 
governance structure that made it easy to apply. So um, the biodiversity world is now discussing how to proceed. Mm -hmm. And um, there may be more information about IGSNs uh, oh, uh, published shortly too, we hope, Jens? Um, yes, um, we're working on an overview paper to describe how the system is set up in, from an organizational perspective and science use. And then there will be a separate paper outlining the technical implementation. Um, a question from Will. Can this system be used for samples that are not able to appear? Uh, I think it's supposed to be in a public catalog. Yes, um, it can. Be, so you can think of this in the same way as DOI are being used. When you resolve a DOI, it doesn't always get you to the object that you are like in the paper, most papers are not publicly accessible. You have to have a subscription. So there, off, there are good reasons why you will, you, why you don't want to disclose the details of an of a sample to the public. That can be for, that can be rare species or a sensitive site, and so the only rule is it has to resolve to something. But um, what you want to disclose is up to your discretion. Leslie, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, it's just that uh, certainly, as I said, we have a lot of fossil fossils in this, and I can assure you the locations of many of those fossils in certain organisations are not publicly available. But you do know there, there has been a fossil collected from Alice Springs, but only certain people who are qualified will get what that specific location is. So the system does definitely have safeguards around that. Okay. Oh, the other, uh, the other thing I wanted to add is, uh, for maybe of interest to people listening, is that um, it's not just for land-based specimens. In the US it is widely used for the ocean drilling program and for marine samples as well. And once you get into marine areas, of course, a lot of it is bio samples. So um, it's just kind of organic the way it's starting to grow into other areas because as Yen said, the life sciences identify system collapsed and people just see the need for um, having unique identifiers for their samples and this is what's happening. So related to that, uh, the next question is, are you aware of anything similar for pathology specimens? I'm not, Jens, what about you? I have read about identifiers for cell cultures, but I'm not aware that they have this kind of um, resilient resolving mechanism. And that's also just to pass on, that's the um, basis of what we were doing last week and why groups like GBIF and Tadwig are getting interested in what we've got. It's that core kernel that applies to the registration of a sample with the group in Germany. But that you can then go into a next layer out that uh, with the metadata is more in tune with a rock sample or something else. Um, you know, or a plant sample. You know, you, you, the communities develop their own additional metadata, but it's that core um, component that is the bit that can be cloned for other groups if they so want to. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the questions. So thanks everyone for attending today's webinar and thanks very much to Jens and Leslie for their time in sharing that. There was a lot of good discussion, a lot of interest around IGSNs, which I think we'll have to follow up through the um, email after the webinar and um, as, men as I mentioned earlier this is actually a series on persistent identifiers and the third one is uh, on linking publications and data so you can find out about that uh, the webinar series through the ANS website or subscribing to ANS News. So thanks for coming everybody and um, bye. Well, thank you very much bye. for having us. Thank you, yeah.